So my name is Brian Lebovic. I am uh, commonly called a trial lawyer. That was the first uh, business that I started. Since that time, I've done a lot of businesses. I'm still a trial lawyer, uh, but I've owned a tropical smoothie cafe. I've had a magazine called The Good Life Magazine. I own a medical billing company that spans across the nation. Uh, we do all sorts of different businesses. So there's, there's lots of things that I've been involved in. And of all of them, the things that the thing that has been most formative to me has been the trial lawyer job. And the reason that it's been most formative is because the trial lawyer job has so much human impact, so much emotion, so much truly tragic consequences that we try to come back from and help people um, recover from as a part of the job. So let me ask this. How many all drive? Let's start there. So almost everybody in the room drives. You, have you gotten a permit yet? Permit, great. Anybody not at least have a permit? Great. When you went to go and get your permit, or do you remember that your parents had to go with you? And they had to sign some documents, right? The documents that they signed were not permission. The state doesn't care if you have permission to drive or not. What the state wants is for somebody with money to sign the dotted line that if you get into an accident, they're going to pay the bill. And that bill extends far beyond what you can imagine because I don't think you recognize how deep you can put your family in the hole on the minute that your mom or dad signed that line. All right? So the reason that they do that is because they know kids don't have money. Like the amount of money that you guys have in your bank account, I don't care how rich you are, is probably not enough to pay for the human tragedy that will happen if you hurt somebody in an automobile. All right, let's talk about a case, a very simple case. So this is a very common case for me, right? I probably had three people or four people come in this week with this exact case. Young boy driving down the road, had his license for two weeks, real story. I, I, I has a, an iPod, an old iPod, right? So to give you an idea, you know, how old. It was a spin wheel iPod, and he has it aux corded into his car so he can play his playlists while he's driving. He's going down Indian Town Road in Jupiter, Florida, and he ends up looking down for too long and crashing into the back of my client's car at about 25 to 30 miles an hour. Traffic had backed up at a traffic light. He didn't realize how far it had backed up, and they hit cars. This kid's driving a Volvo station wagon. My client's driving a Ford F-250 truck with a hitch on it. Big car, right? The car gets hit. The hitch punches into the, the front of the uh, Volvo, but the Volvo doesn't have a huge amount of crush damage. It can be driven away, and the truck doesn't have a huge amount of truck damage. It can be driven away, but the impact happens. The cars lurch forward. My client gets out of his truck holding his neck. The boy, whose father is a local lawyer, calls his dad, calls the police. Dad comes, police come, and everybody agrees that the boy, you know, was, you know, not you know, paying attention, he was looking at his, his thing, and he shouldn't have hit him from behind. But at that time, although the man's neck hurt a little bit, no one thought it was a big deal. The lawyer father said, we'll take care of any property damage. Don't worry about it. Hope you feel OK. I think it'll be all right. Not a big case. Not a big case. My client, the guy in the truck, goes home, says to his wife, can you believe it? I just got rear-ended by some kid. He only had his license for two weeks. You know, goes to bed. Wakes up in the middle of the night, can't feel his arm. Next day, he's got pain radiculating down into his arm, and his low back is hurting him a little bit. Says, I need to just go and get kind of adjusted by my chiropractor. Goes the next day to a chiropractor. Chiropractor does a bunch of physical tests. Says, I'm a little concerned. You've got neuropathy in this hand that I'm seeing on the tests. I think you need to go to a neurologist. Three days later, he goes to a neurologist. Neurologist says, I think the chiropractor's right. I think you've got neuropathy. I'm going to send you for an MRI. Sends him for an MRI. MRI reveals he has a frank herniation, which is a big, fat, herniated disc in your back. You have vertebrae. Between the vertebrae, you have intervertebral discs. Those discs have something inside of them called nucleus pulposus. And if the outside annulus fibrosus, which is the tissue that holds that disc together, breaks, and that material comes out onto your spine, it's going to start to paralyze you. He needs to have an operation. The operation cuts your neck open, goes through your neck, moves your throat and spine over, tries not to get your, your, any, any veins cut. They take that disc and they dig it out with a shovel. They put in an artificial disc. 
They put you together, they put plates and screws on it, and that's called an ACDF, an anterior cervical discectomy and fusion. That operation costs somewhere between $150,000 and $200,000. The guy who was hit, my client, is an out of work now engineer. He's making $150,000 a year. He's out of work for weeks and weeks trying to recover. Unfortunately, he gets an infection. The infection causes him to have to go through all sorts of medical treatment. The medical treatment fails. The doctor has to go back in, do a second operation, take the plates and screws out, clean them out, treat them, put the screws and plates back in, close them back up, another $150,000, $200,000. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars in medical bills later, two, three hundred thousand dollars in lost wages later. This claim is approaching a million dollars in economic damages. In other words, without my client getting a dollar for pain and suffering, without my client looking at his future work life, without my client looking at any future medical bills or lost wages, this claim is approaching a million dollars. And they both walked away. They drove away. That's how serious this can be, right? That's how serious this can be. And this boy was just driving, doing his iPod, looked down at his iPod, right? Unfortunately, the attorney's father had a $250,000 insurance policy. Well, $250,000 doesn't cover a million dollars in damages. And so he went to a lawyer and got a lawsuit started, and we sued that other attorney. And as we were getting and ready to go through the lawsuit, we took that young boy's depot, and he told me, under oath that he thought it was five to ten seconds that he wasn't looking at the road but instead was playing with an electronic device and I don't know if you realize this but there's a no texting law in this state you can't text and drive but it's really not you can't text and drive it means that if you take your time away from driving a car so that you can play with an electronic device that's sitting right with you and you're not paying attention that that's a breach of a law in the state of Florida, and a judge can allow you to add a new type of damages to the case called punitive damages. So here's two types of damages. You have the economic and non-economic damages called compensatory damages. In other words, to compensate somebody for the losses that they have. That would be the $800,000 in medical bills, maybe eight hundred dollars or a million dollars in pain and suffering damages, future lost wages, which an economic you know, professional might come in and say, are two or three hundred thousand dollars future medical bills if God forbid he needs another operation because once you have an ACDF and one disc level is locked down, what happens to the two levels above and below it? Those two levels have more flexion, which makes them weaker, which makes them blow out over time, which means that he might need another operation as he gets older. The bills just get bigger and bigger. Huge bills. But that's not punishment. That's what punitive damages are. They're punishment. So you take all of this money over here that's compensatory, and if the judge says, Mr. Lobovic, you're right. Looking down at an iPod for 10 seconds while driving a car is reckless. That's a reckless thing to do. I'm going to allow you to include punitive damages on this uh, verdict, which means I can ask the jury if looking down away from a car for 10 seconds while holding an electronic device when the law tells you you're not allowed to do that is a reckless thing to do that the jury can come back and they can give them usually three times the amount of, pun of, of compensatory damages. So if I've got two million dollars in economic damages and non-economic damages and pain and suffering, right, and I get three times that, I'm going to get six million dollars in punitive damages. You add those together, it's an eight million dollar verdict when two people walked away from an accident from a 25 mile an hour impact with two big cars that didn't have a ton of property damage. Now here's the scariest part. Because in America, we believe in the fresh start, right? You've ever heard of a bankruptcy? You get a giant judgment on you, you have giant debt on you, you get into a bad business organization, something terrible happens, your family loses its job, whatever it is, giant medical bills. If you haven't done anything wrong, and you got into a bad situation financially, you can bankrupt all that stuff. So all that money on compensatory damages can be bankrupt, right? It's a fresh start. You can just go to court, go through a bankruptcy. It hurts your credit. It makes you have, be a bankrupt person. It's not something you would want, but it won't ruin you for life. Can you bankrupt punitive damages? No. 
Six million dollars, you're never getting rid of it. It's going to earn interest at 12% per year. Six million dollars at 12% per year is $120,000 a year. Just in interest. Keeps clicking away. If you can't pay it off, when you get a job, a collection attorney sends you a collection notice to your boss, says, send me 50% of this guy's pay. He owes $6 million in a punitive damage verdict. You're going to work for that man the rest of your life just because you are not paying attention driving a car. If you're texting and driving, if you're drinking and driving, if you're goofing around and driving and somebody thinks that the, the things you were doing in that car, whether it's eating or you know, letting people wrestle in the back seat, or somebody covers your eyes where you could both be liable for that. You don't want that, right? So the key, the key to this is while you're driving, just drive. Just drive. All right? That's the key. Just drive. And if people are messing around in your car, stop the car. Say, put in your seatbelts. I got to drive. If I get hurt, I go down. But not only I go down, but remember the beginning of this thing? I asked you about permission. Your whole family goes down. Because you signed on the line, and if we get a giant judgment against you, your dad or mom or whoever else signed on that line goes down too. Which means that we come into your house and we take all the stuff that your parents bought and we sell it at auction. And we make people do crazy things like sell their cars and sell their bikes and sell their toasters. Right? Because they can't pay this judgment off. And so all your stuff becomes subject to attachment. You ruin all that work your parents did for all those years, putting you through private school and making sure you all have decent cars to drive and making a nice house for you to live in. It all goes away because you were not paying attention and you thought that you could drink and drive or text and drive or do something like that and drive their car. How's that for a scary story? It's a scary story. And the reason that I want to impart it to you guys is because if you understand that this is real life, that you as volunteers for this organization can impart that message to your students, your friends, right? And the key to this is that six, eight, ten years from now, after you all have happily gone through college and survived all of those years of having fun and partying and enjoying yourselves through all that, that you all come back and you say to me or Tara or anybody else in this organization who's in this school as a, as a high school student, and you say, yeah, listen to the lessons of Safety for Life because they kept me safe and it let, let me be a really happy person and it'll keep you safe too. And that's what we want you guys to understand and know. We want you to feel the weight of what's going on. This is a really dangerous activity, driving cars. And I don't think that people appreciate it because it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere, right? Like, cars are everywhere. We can't get anywhere in Florida without cars. So know that it's dangerous. Respect it. And know that you can save lives by doing that and telling your friends to respect their cars and not text and drive or drink and drive. All right? That's the message we wanted to get out to you guys. Any questions? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we want to get the message out as, as best we can. We want to have big school assemblies. We want to do crash reenactments. I mean, we have a lot of plans to get the message out to the kids. But as an individual, right, you're going to be in the car tomorrow with your friend, and he's going to pull out a phone and text. It's just going to happen. Your parents are going to text, right? You need to say to them, listen, i got to tell you, you know that crazy bald lawyer on TV? He came and talked to us, and he kind of scared me because if you get into an accident while you're texting, you're going to get this thing called punitive damages against you. You can't discharge it in bankruptcy. It'll ruin your life. It'll ruin your friend's life. It'll ruin your, your parents' life. I mean, like, the amount of damages that can happen from this car accident, just make sure you're not texting and driving, not drinking and driving. Like, be safe. Just drive while you're doing this. I'm just trying to tell you because if you get into an accident, it'll be terrible for you and your family. I, 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 you know, like, I'm telling you, sincere belief. This guy converted me to believe that this is the truth about the way American law works. And no one really knows it. And you just have to impart that passion to them and let them know, I'm telling you for your sake. I'm telling you because I know you care about your sister and your brother and your family. And if you get into an accident and your parents have to pay it, all that money disappears and none of y'all can pay for private school and then your college fund goes away. You know, like you don't want that. And it doesn't have to be a huge accident. It can be a really small, when, when, when things are tragic, right? 
things blow out of proportion. I've got a, an awful case where a guy who was drunk hit a family and he killed, this guy's driving down the road with his wife and two children, 11 and 13 years old, and a drunk guy takes him out and he wakes up six months later in the hospital, wife and two children dead. All right, that's terrible things that happen. But we as people like driving around are like, yeah, that's terrible, but it's late at night, the guy obviously was drunk, I'm not gonna drive drunk, blah, 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 right? We have this Superman complex in our head and we think it's not gonna happen to me, it'll happen to that guy, right? It's the way that we wake up every morning. Like I drove down here and I didn't think I could be taken out by a truck, you know, like I don't think it because of my Superman complex in my head. But you gotta get people over that. You gotta teach them, you know, like put that thing aside and recognize that it's so easy to get into an accident and even a small accident can create huge damages that we have to be really prepared and you just gotta drive when you drive, right? And that's the message that you wanna get to these people. Like, I deal in civil law, I don't put people in jail. If somebody does something criminal, which is behavior so badly that it's likely to lead to human injury, that could be reckless, and reckless could be a criminal action, and the state attorney could pick that up, and they could run with it, or the police could arrest somebody for that. Driving drunk is obviously a crime, right? So you can go to jail for driving drunk, but I can also sue you for driving drunk. So you can have a civil case and a criminal case, and you have to deal with both of them, right? So as soon as you get out of jail, you then have this you know, criminal civil case that attaches onto it, and whatever happened in this, the criminal case is not what happens in the civil case. You all grew up in the era of social media. I mean, uh, we did not grow up in that, and so I'm so sad for you guys because of what you suffer, which is that every human being in this room probably right now has a video camera on them and can film people doing bad behavior, right? And then they can post it on social media where it lives forever. Or you can film yourself and put it on social media where you may think you're being cute, funny, sarcastic, or otherwise, you know, like not a big deal, and you're filming yourself saying and doing things that are awful, underage drinking, saying things about not caring about drinking, and those things will come back and haunt you. They will be found and they will be used by the criminal prosecutor and the civil prosecutor, and we will absolutely hunt you down, uh, your, your Facebook and your Instagrams and your TikToks and all that stuff, because we get more, as a, an attorney, I can tell you, we get more good stuff from people's admissions of what they do and say on their TikTok or Instagram than anywhere else, right? So there are instances where, you know, people have said, you know, like, I'm going out, I'm drink, they drunk, of course, and they post, I'm going out, I'm drinking, and I don't give an F, because I can do this better than anybody while I'm drunk, right? And that's coming in, you know, that's coming into the trial. This drunk person who just got in an accident and hurt somebody, saying, I'm going to go drive and I don't give, you don't think that a jury's going to find that person punitively liable? And once they see that, they'll find it, and how bad are they going to punish them? with the damages when that happens. That, that, that's called a damage driver, right? That adds value to the case. Me as a civil lawyer, I think, oh my God, I'm just gonna have to show that to the jury and ask them for $10 million, and they're gonna be like, yeah, punish that person, $10 million. Punitive damages, never get out of it, I'll own them for their life. They'll never be able to get out of the damages, and they will absolutely have to pay this for the rest of it. It's, it's terrible, terrible. Don't do that. Like, stay off social media unless you're posting like, these are me and my friends, and we're doing charity. These are me and my friends, we're on vacation, we're having a nice time. Like, beware of what you put out there on social media. I know you probably heard the warning before, but as an attorney who checks out other people's social media, you'd be surprised at the stuff that I find. I look at it for everybody that we hire. I'll go on and find their, their social. It's private. I'm like, okay, let me find a way, you know? We find a lot. We find so much. I mean, it's, it's shocking what people put out there. And not for nothing, but especially girls. Girls, you guys do some really revealing things that seem very unprofessional in the real world when you get out of your young life and you start doing things in the real world. We think, all right, what type of judgment does this person have if this is the type of thing they think is appropriate? I'm just telling you the way employers feel. This isn't really about you know, criminal versus civil versus, you know, 
But if you're looking at jobs, you guys are going to get jobs someday, make that Facebook professional. And now there's AI programs, like there's all this artificial intelligence that can hunt millions of records, that goes through millions of records, and they'll find profiles that match up with the person they want to hunt. So they're looking for anybody who shows insecurity, overt sexuality, girls who might have done things that make them think that they might, you know, be involved with sex for hire. I mean, like, there, there's people hunting that with AI, and they're programming machines to find you and look at what you're posting and then start to entice you into it. That anybody who's out there looking at, and you go down the well, right? Like, you go down the hole, where all of a sudden, they, they, the, the machines, the AI machines, want you to stay on at, you know, Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. They send you into things that are a purient interest of kind of this negative inference interest because they know it keeps you on longer, right? And then those people find that and start to hunt you. So I don't know if you saw, but a few weeks ago, there was a young boy who was convicted of murder of a young boy because he became an ISIS terrorist. Anybody see that in the paper? So this young boy who was, got involved with ISIS online and you know, started just out of curiosity and then decided he was going to you know, convert and do this. And they continued to convince him that he was going to be a great ISIS terrorist. And then he killed a... Uh, he was 17 years old. He killed a 15-year-old boy because it was his, you know, obligation to this terrorist group. So you'd be surprised what people are doing online. It's amazing. It's terrifying. There's a lot of good. I mean, I'm trying to tell you, don't get online because there's a lot of good to be found online, right? There's a lot of fun that's going to be online and we all are interacting online and I love this concept of the metaverse. I don't know if you guys are are paying attention to the metaverse. How many people have an Oculus? Life-changing, right? Life-changing. I'm like, I put that thing on, I couldn't believe it. I've got another lawyer in California who's using this Oculus, right? And he's creating client interactions by sending the Oculus to his clients and creating a, a virtual world, it's engaged uh, VR, which is a virtual world that you can go to, and he can talk to them and they can talk to each other and they can interact and look at documents and talk about things in this virtual world where his client's in California and he's in Florida. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's crazy, right? It's just crazy. So yeah, there's going to be a lot. I mean, like you can't run from technology. You can't run from your future. But you also can recognize that you have to behave in a way that that future doesn't take advantage of you, right? So just keep, keep yourself safe. All right. Well, thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.